Evening. We are so happy to have uh, David Baldacci back to discuss his new book, The Escape. Um, it's been exactly a year since he was here uh, to talk about King and Maxwell. Um, and uh, we're, we're so excited to hear about another one of his recurring characters, John Puller. Um, I'm going to let him tell you more about, about the book and all that. I certainly wouldn't want to spoil anything for anyone. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with all of his work. It's pretty extensive at this point, um, and with his characters who are, you know, so enthralling. Um, his books are published now in over 45 languages and in more than 80 countries, and he's really showing no signs of slowing down. Um, so we're hoping that he's back again this time next year. Um, he also, with his wife, is the co-founder of the Wish You Well Foundation, which supports literacy efforts across the country, and we are um, accepting donations for them tonight. You can leave any books you'd like to donate um, with us behind our cash registers. So with that, we are... Uh, so pleased to have him back here. Please join me in welcoming David Baldacci to Politics and Prose. First of all, I never get dressed up for a book signing. I usually come in jeans. Uh, I have another event later tonight that my wife said I had to go to. And I've been married for almost 25 years, so I always listen to my wife. If she tells me I have to be somewhere, I'm going. Is this microphone working? Okay, all right, good. Um, well, thank you very much for coming tonight. I know it's a really busy time of year. I tell people I don't think I would come and stand in line uh, for me to sign my own book. I don't think I would. I just <laughs> wouldn't do it. I, and so I'm just thrilled and I'm stunned sometimes when people show up for book signings. It's, it makes me feel terrific. Um, how many people were here last year? Okay, I get to tell some of the old stories. Great. Um, <laughs> Uh, the Escape is the third uh, in the John Puller series, and John Puller is an Army investigator, um, and his brother Robert Puller was in the Air Force, a major, uh, and he was convicted of national security crimes. So now he is serving a life sentence in Leavenworth at the Disciplinary Barracks Prison there, which is a high maximum security prison for military prisoners. And he does the um, sort of inexplicable, as the title gives away, he escapes from this prison you're not supposed to be able to escape from. And he has a lot of national security secrets, obviously, in his mind. Um, so they need to ca capture him very quickly. So what they do is they bring their, his brother John Puller in, who knows his brother better than anyone on earth. And it's sort of a tale of brother hunting down brother. Now, I set this story up in the very first Puller book, Zero Day, where you learned that Robert Puller was in prison. And I guess you're probably thinking, my God, you know, he doesn't seem like a bad guy. Is he really guilty? Did he really do this stuff? And that was a foreshadowing for this. And uh, this novel was sort of the payoff for that. You'll get to see the truth behind Robert Puller and all the other things go along with that. So I had a lot of fun writing it. You know, when I started thinking about doing military uh, character and in the military arena. My dad had been in the Navy, but I had never served, so I really wanted to immerse myself. I have great respect for those who serve, and I wanted to do it right. Um, it's not something you can really Wikipedia or Google, although I think some writers tend to try to do that. So the first thing I did was I jumped on a plane and went down to Fort Benning in Georgia with a lieutenant colonel of mine who's retired. He was an Army Ranger. And uh, I spent three days down there uh, with the Rangers getting my butt kicked from one end of the base to the other. Uh, we went first to the parachute jumping grounds. And I've learned, boy, I tell you, the Army is really sticklers for sort of, you know, scheduling. Uh, so I was there for three days, and I got there, and they gave me my itinerary. It was 147 pages long. Um, every five minutes of my life while I was there was documented and chronicled. And where I was going, who was going to take me there, how long I was going to be there, what I was going to do while I was there, who was going to take me to the next, next event, so on and so on and so on. The only thing they left out or forgot about was actually feeding me. <laughs> so the whole three days I was down there, I was sort of, it was just up to me to find out and figure out how I was going to feed myself. So that's okay. So the parachute jumping grounds, they have two towers at Fort Benning. One is 212 feet high, and you jump off of that with an actual parachute, and the theory is you land safely. And the, they wouldn't let me jump off of that tower, you know. <laughs> Thank God. Anyway, um, but the other tower is only four stories high and has a little shack at the top. It's got a little cutout door, like a, the, a plain fuselage door, and you're attached to a zip line on that one. And that one, they would let me jump off. So I'm down below, and I got like 50 paratroopers who jump out of a plane for a living, and they are putting my crash helmet on and, and, and giving me advice and putting the harnesses and straps and everything. And they said, look, you know, the, the harnesses around your chest and shoulders will take care of themselves. That's where the zip line's going to be attached to. 
but now you, you have these harnesses and straps around your thighs. They have to be cranked down really tightly because when you jump out of that tower, you're gonna drop pretty fast. And if those straps are not tight, they're gonna move and they'll hit a part of your anatomy you'll never forget. <laughs> So as I'm going up the tower, my friend was videotaping, I'm going up the tower, I'm cranking these straps <laughs> around my thighs so tight I had no blood flow in my lower extremities. <laughs> I get up to the top of the tower and it's just me and the jump master up there. And the first question he asked was, basic, are you afraid of heights? Now I have to tell you, if you're on the ground, you're looking up four stories, no problem. If you're up four stories looking straight down, it's kind of a big deal, actually. It's a different perception, I found. So I looked down and I was like, you know, not until I got up here. He said, okay, here's how it's gonna go. He attached a little zip line to my harness and it ran out a hole in the wall and I couldn't see the zip line. I couldn't see anything out that doorway that was gonna support me from like dying once I jumped out. It was just the open air. He said, back up to the wall, get a running start, you're going to jump out into the open air. Now jump as far away from the building as you can, and you won't drop as fast. Then you're going to get ripped really violently to the right because they're trying to simulate you jumping out of an airplane. Now he said it's critical, critical that you keep your chin tucked tightly to your chest. I was like, why is that so important? He said, well, otherwise the cable will come around and it'll take your ear right off. Now, I thought he was kind of just exaggerating until like three or four months later, I, I was doing a book signing and a guy came up to me, you know, tall, fit, buzz cut, military, and he said he had a ball cap on and he said, hey, I heard you jumped at Benning. I said, yeah, I did. He said, yeah, me too. And he took off his cap. He said, I forgot to tuck my chin. He turned, half of his ear is gone. So I excused myself, went to the restroom, I threw up. <laughs> I came back, finished the signing because I'm, I'm a tough guy. So I said to the jump master, okay, that box is checked, chin here, got it. And uh, he said, you're gonna be going on a zip line about at a 50 degree angle to the ground really fast, uh, and there'll be soldiers waiting to give you further instructions. <laughs> so I looked at him, I said, do you mean while I'm still in the air? He said, yes, sir. I was like, okay. Now, while I was up there, you know, sort of trying to do this, um, the paratroopers on the ground, uh, they had a betting pool going. And it was 50 to 1 that I was not going to jump. The only guy who bet for me was my buddy who flew down there with me. And he admitted later that he also bet a lot more money that I wouldn't jump. <laughs> and I guess I, I, it took me like, I have to admit, it took me like five or six minutes to work up the nerve to back up to the wall and just jump out into the open air. It's not something human beings just normally do, right? And one of the paratroopers you could hear on the videotape later, I just got a real chuckle out of this. He said, what the hell is he doing up there? Writing a damn book? <laughs> and I was like, why, yes. That's the whole point. That's why I'm here. So I figured I've got to do this. I mean, there's no way I'm not going to jump with all these guys down there who jump out of a plane, right? So I backed up the wall got a running start. I jumped out as far away from the building as I could. I kept my chin here. And I got to tell you, I still felt that stupid strap come around, like flick the back of my ear. And I get ripped to the right and I'm flying down at a really steep angle. And I see a six foot high, solid dirt berm wall. And I'm heading right for it at speed. I'm going to crash into this wall. And my first thought was, what idiot put a wall on the parachute jumping grounds? And then I realized that people are screaming at me. And they're screaming out, lift your feet, sir. Lift your feet immediately. Those were the further instructions. <laughs> really. So I lifted my feet past my head somehow. I'm very flexible. And I cleared the berm. And they were grabbing my harness to stop me before I really hurt myself. Um, and for that, uh, the Army gave me a piece of paper. And it said, congratulations, you jumped signed United States Army. I've got it framed, it's in my office, you know? I was like, it's such a cool thing. So I did the sniper range where you're shooting at targets you can't even see with the naked eye. It's all through scope. And it's so weird to fire a high-powered rifle. Like I fired lots of weapons over the years. I'm not a big gun aficionado, but for research, I fired just about everything you can possibly fire. And, but it's really weird to fire a weapon, you know, sort of, you know, then you sort of count one Mississippi, two Mississippi, and then you hear, ping, 
if it hits the target. You know, you think kind of with a bullet, it's instantaneous. When you're firing something over over a thousand meters away, it takes a little while for the bullet to get there. They even had these special binoculars that you can look through the shows. You can watch the flight of the bullet while it's going with a little plume behind. It was like the freakiest thing I've ever seen, but kind of neat. And I did the Humvee rollover test. They put you in a Humvee and they spin, they strap you in, they spin you around until you're totally disoriented and hang you upside down. And then they give you an order to egress. And the weird thing is, since but now you're upside down, you have to put your hand on the ceiling of the vehicle because now it's the floor of the vehicle because if you undo your harnesses, you'll like fall and like crack your skull open. So you got one hand here, you're done. I got, out, I got out of there so fast, the guy who was running it said, no one I've ever tested has got out of that Humvee as fast as you did. And I was like, that's right. <laughs> then I got into the other side he spun me around and he gave me the order to egress and I'm like you know I'm doing this I'm do I can't get the harness unlatched and finally a minute goes by and the guy says is there a problem I said the harness won't come unlatched he goes well keep in mind you're in the passenger side I was like oh okay harness is on the other side the latch for it I didn't break any records with that one sorry <laughs> But the best thing that I did during the time I was down there, I just talked to people. I interviewed people um, from privates on up to generals. And I just wanted to know, you know, why did you do this? You know, what made you decide you wanted to serve, put on the uniform? Because back then when I was doing this book, the uh, wars in the Middle East were still going hot and heavy. So Iraq and Afghanistan were still going on. And since this is all infantry at Benning, and back then at least it was all males, these guys were maybe 18. I think the average age was 19. Um, they got 12 weeks of basic training, another four weeks of specialized training for some of them. And the very next day, they were on a plane to Afghanistan. And they're going to be in harm's way. It wasn't like they were joining the Army to stay stateside and just, you know, learn the skill or whatever. They were going into combat. And got lots of different answers uh, from people. You know, some were like, I want to, we were attacked. I want to defend my country. I want to serve. I'm, I'm a patriotic. Some were, this is the best opportunity I have to have a good life. Um, where I came from, I can go here. If I survive the war, I can learn some skills. I can get some money for college, and I can have a better life, and I'm willing to risk it. So it was sort of, you know, just a plethora of dis different reasons why people were going to do it. With all that in mind, over the course of three days and a lot of other interviews and a lot of other travel going to other places, trying to really find out the, mili the military's head and heart, I was able to write, I think, a much better book. Never again really never could have Wikipedia this stuff you just can't because anybody can Wikipedia stuff and all of you can get on a Wikipedia but I found that just sitting down and talking to people and doing some of the things they do uh, really can add great depth to a story and that's what I try to do with all, all the ones that I write. Now I'm in the middle of a book tour right now and I get a lot of questions during those tours and probably the one I get more than any other is what is it like to be a number one best-selling novelist whose books are sold all over the world and I know the way they ask the question they really want some sort of Hollywood glitzy answer you know like I get up at noon every day and I have a favorite jacket that I put on and I have a tiny little dog I carry under my arm and I go down to my study where I have nine assistants waiting to write down anything I might happen to say now, my life is not like that at all. If you ask my wife, she'll tell you. I get home from a cool event. I'm telling her about it. She's like, yeah, 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 fine. It's trash night. Get on it. <laughs> so, in my King and Maxwell series, Michelle Maxwell is like this kick butt, as you know. Um, my wife's name is Michelle as well. So if you want to know what the role model for Michelle Maxwell, <laughs> you just have to look right next to me. There she is. So... Uh, in, in, in the answer to that question, I tell people about a story about my kids when they were little. My kids are both grown now. They're both in college. But um, when my daughter was five, I took her to a book signing for the very first time with me. She had no idea what dad did for a living. And in kindergarten, she was like, I don't know. My dad just, I don't know what my dad does. You know, he sits at home. This is why I didn't have an office outside of the house. He sits at home. Um, and that's about all I know, you know. So she never asked me to go to career day <laughs> in kindergarten class because she was like ashamed. What are you going to say? You know, you know, Danny's dad is a policeman. What are you going to do? I sit at home? No, I'm not going to embarrass myself, Dad. Sorry. Um, so I, we went to the bookstore, and all these people were waiting. And the lady who ran the bookstore came over and, and introduced herself. And she, and she asked my daughter, do you know why all these people are here? And my daughter said, yes, I know. And she goes, why are all these people here? They want my dad to sign their book. Why do they want your dad to sign their book? Because my dad has the nicest handwriting. <laughs> She's the senior in college now. I still think she believes that, quite frankly. <laughs> I took my son to a bookstore, just a bookstore, not a signing, maybe when he was three. 
and we walked into the bookstore. He's kind of a little capitalist anyway, you know. He walked into the bookstore and he saw the books, all the people reading, and his eyes got huge. And he was like, he started running across the bookstore screaming at the top of his lungs, my dad will send any, sign any book you've got for $2. Not books that I wrote, any book you have. You know, you got a Hemingway, Faulkner, bring it over here. Done. You'll be glad to know because I love politics and prose. I've waived my signing fee for tonight. So <laughs> I'll sign your book for free. No problem there. So that's kind of what it's like. You know, I, I sign books for $2 sometimes, and that's, that's my whole life. That's what it's like to be a best selling novelist. Um, I was telling somebody this story uh, the other night. So actually, I was at a thing, and, and people asked questions, and one guy said, hey, tell that story you know, that you used to tell about so-and-so. And so here's the story I used to tell about so-and-so. Um, I've gotten to the point in my career where agencies, you know, even clandestine agencies, come to me because they would like to be in my books. you know. <laughs> and I had one who came and said, they called up and said, would you like to come into our world headquarters in Maryland? We'd like to show you around. I was like... Okay, sounds cool. So they sent a car and went up to Maryland and and went through there. And it's a place where they give you an RF badge, radio frequency badge. It has your, all your security and clearances loaded into it. And when you go into this facility, it shoots out a signal and they have transponders everywhere. And if you're not cleared for a particular place, space in the building, an alarm goes off, all the computer screens go black instantly. So you can, can't see anything on the screens inadvertently. Well, that was cool, except for the fact that I have no security clearances. So every room I went into, the alarms went off and all the computer screens went black. So people are all jumping up, all ticked off at me, like, who the hell are you? And I'm like, you invited me. <laughs> so they went, they showed me a lot of stuff they do, which is really, really cool. Let's say the president is going to go to Seattle and the Secret Service comes to them and says, okay, here's the motorcade route. We want you to 3D the city of Seattle for us and we want you to show us where all the sniper spots could be on the motorcade route and then we'll put an agent in every single one of them to stop that threat from ever happening. They keep all the maritime shipping lanes safe around the world. Uh, they're a big military support agency. Let's say there's a tank brigade in Afghanistan and they dial them up and say, you know what, we want to see what's on the other side of that mountain. And they send a satellite over there and they give them firing coordinates. So the tanks fire over the mountain and blow up the bad guys without ever putting U.S. troops in harm's way. Kind of neat stuff. So we spent about six or seven hours going through all the neat stuff they do. And they took me to a conference room. We sat down. It's like 12 guys with these big fat briefing books in front of them. And I'm still really wondering why I'm there, you know. And uh, so the big honcho guy says, Mr. Baldacci, have you ever seen the movie Enemy of the State? And I was like, uh, isn't that the one with Will Smith and Gene Hackman? I said, yeah, that was, the sad that was really a cool movie. I like that. And he said, no, it wasn't. And I looked at all the 12 guys. They're looking at me like, you know, no, it wasn't. I was like, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, I said, you're right. The movie, the movie sucked. Um, I, must have, I must have mixed it up with another movie. Uh, and why was it a bad movie? He said, well, because the agency that was doing all this evil stuff with the satellites, seeing everything, um, Hollywood and its infinite stupidity, said that agency was the NSA, which any moron... Mr. Baldacci knows the NSA listens in on conversations, and, and we know they do. <laughs> um, they aren't the eyes of American intelligence. They're the ears of American intelligence. We're the eyes of American intelligence. We see everything. Who cares what you can hear about? That's not such a big deal. We see everything. We were the evil agency in that movie, and we got absolutely no credit for it. <laughs> I was like, yeah, well, I, I can understand that. I guess I, I'd be upset, too. So um, he said, now, what we want you to do, we would like you to write about us in one of your novels. Uh, we'll give you resources, access to what we can. Uh, he said, I can tell you, quite frankly, we do evil a lot better than NSA ever thought about doing evil. <laughs> and he said, don't get me started on those punks at the CIA, okay? And I said, okay, but I said, why do, you, why do you care about that so much? He said, well, it helps us with recruitment. I said, explain that to me. He said, well, the CIA and the NSA, everybody knows who they are. So when the best and the brightest come out of Collins, they want to go into the clandestine services. They don't think of us. They think of the CIA and the NSA. And because of that, they always get the best, the cream of the crop. 
and we don't. We want to get the best and the brightest. In order to do that, we need to get out into the popular culture, into the movies, into the books, and that's where you can help us. It's like, you know, I guess it made sense, although I, I, I frankly, I was just sitting there going, am I, is this, am I being punked, you know? <laughs> because is somebody just going to jump out and say, ha ha, but nobody jumped out and said that. So I wrote about them in, in one book. I didn't really make them a primary player. I didn't really make them the evil machine because it just didn't work for the story. But it was kind of weird, you know. But I, at that point, anything goes as far as I'm concerned. I just Somebody asked me, what are you bound by you know, when you write your thrillers? And I said, plausibility. And I said, it's a great time to be a thriller writer. I can write about anything. And people won't believe it could happen, you know, for good reasons and bad reasons. So... So that was, that was my experience with that agency that I shall not name, but uh, you probably can figure it out if you, if you know that world really well. Now, with uh, my novels, I've been published in almost 50 languages, and in all those languages, the name on the book is David Baldacci, um, except for one. One language, one country, I was f literally forced to adopt a pseudonym for my first novel. I was at home, this is before Absolute Power, which was my first book, was published anywhere. And I got a call from my agent in New York, and he said, I have your Italian publishers in my office right now, Mondadori. They're the largest publisher in Italy, been around for 100 years. They're very excited about the prospects of publishing Absolute Power in Italian. However, they have a little problem with the name. So at first I thought he was talking about the title of the book. You know, and I said, well, you know, absolute power should translate really well into Italian, but if it doesn't, they contain the title of the book. The German, if you go to Germany and try to find absolute power, you won't be able to find it. In German, it was uh, published under Der President. You know, makes sense. <laughs> so he said, no, they love the title. Absolute power translates wonderfully into Italian. Uh, the problem they have, of course, is with your name. <laughs> now, for those of you who thought that Baldacci was, I don't know, Irish. It's not. Um, I'm Italian-American. Lots of vowels in that name. So I said, I said, let me try to get this straight. Are you saying the Italians have a problem with my Italian name? He said, yes, it's a, it's a big problem, actually. I said, well, you know, the Chinese don't, the Koreans don't, the Latvians don't, the Dutch don't, the French love me. So what is the problem with Baldacci in Italian? He said, well, um, apparently it's a well-known fact that Italians don't think that other Italians can write. <laughs> so I said, you know, Dante, Machiavelli, and Puzo had pretty good careers, didn't they? He said, well, much like American films, uh, people in Italy and other countries, they want to see American thrillers, which they think, rightly or wrongly, are like the best of the best. So if they see Baldacci on a cover, they're going to think you're an Italian Italian, not an Italian American, and they're not going to buy your book. And other thriller writers from America with Italian last names have had to change their, their name. Lisa Scottolini, really good friend of mine in, in, in Italy, she's Lisa Scott. Steve Martini, um, he became that comedian, Steve Martin. <laughs> A fine thriller writer and a guy who does the arrow through the head. I said, well, I, I was just stunned. I just could not believe this. And I said, well, what, you know, what sort of a name do they want? He said, well, they want an American name, of course. I said, well, <laughs> we're a country of immigrants. You know, we're all from somewhere else. And he said, oh, you know, I, I, I can see you're getting a little upset about this. So he said, why don't you take a few days and think about it and just give me a call back. And I said, no, you've got... Mondadori in your office right now? He said, yeah. And I said, okay, what, you know what? You give me five seconds. I'll come up with the greatest American name you've ever heard. He said, okay. So I put the phone down and I was like, oh my God, what do I do now? You know, luckily I happened to glance out the window in our driveway and I saw the big blue emblem and I picked the phone up and I said, they can call me David Ford. <laughs> So right away, my agent said, it sounds American. <laughs> my agent is quick, man. He just like, boom, on it. He said, let me try it out on the Italian. So I hear him asking the Italians. He wants to be called David Ford. Now, the next word I hear is screamed out so loud, I can hear it even though this guy's not holding the phone. And the word he screams out is, genius. <laughs> you know, Italians are like very passionate people. <laughs> So my agent gets back on the phone. He goes, oh, my God, David, they, they love it. David Ford. I mean, it's perfect. Um, how did you think of that so fast? 
<laughs> and I said, hey, you gotta remember one thing about me. I'm a writer. <laughs> this stuff oozes off me 24 seven. <laughs> so David Ford, Absolute Power was published, hit number one in Italy. Um, Mr. Ford is a, is a wonderful man, you know, <laughs> and a good writer, almost as good as me. But um, it's, it's interesting because the, the guy who screamed out genius, the chairman of Mondadori, his name, I know you'll think this, I'm making this up, I'm not. His name was, or is, Gianni Ferrari. <laughs> Really, I mean, really. So we would, go, I would, I'd go over to the tour, and he would come with me, and we were always introduced as Ford and Ferrari. <laughs> and I've always thought back, and, and you know, it was like I'm so glad that we sold the Subaru. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't think it would have been nearly as popular, but I don't know, maybe. <laughs> I'll tell you one more story. I'll take some questions. Um, it's interesting. People ask me, too, do you get recognized a lot in public? The answer to that is, of course not. I mean, authors are not real celebrities. We're just not. People don't look at the back of the, of the book to see a picture. They might recognize the name. That happens more often. But for writers, even when you get recognized in public, it's not the ego stroke that you think it might otherwise be. Now, I was at a restaurant with my wife. We're having lunch at a booth, and you know, sometimes you're eating, and then you, you look up, you look around, and I did that, and this lady across the, the way, was sitting at a table, I guess, with her husband, was like laser locked on me, you know, boom, and like, it was so stunning, I was just, I was startled, and I just, oh my God, and so I looked away, and I thought, I must have misread that, it's just, this is too weird, so a couple of wins went by, and I looked again, and just laser locked, you know, and I was like, oh my God, so I just stopped looking up, I just was eating my lunch, and and then I s sensed a presence next to me, and I thought it was our waitress. It was her, you know, and there she was. And so she pushes me over in the booth, and she sits down next to me. <laughs> and she looks at me with a sort of a very coy expression, and she says, You are who I think you are, aren't you? <laughs> you know, English teachers in the room try to diagram that sentence, okay? <laughs> and... I was trying to keep it, you know, calm. So I said, um, well, do you read a lot of fiction? And she said, oh, yes, I do. I chuckled. I said, well, <laughs> okay, I, I guess I am who you think I am. She goes, oh, my God, I can't believe this is happening. This is like the greatest moment of my life. I never thought in a million years I'd ever have the opportunity to meet you. I'm just, I'm overwhelmed. So she turns and screams, literally screams across the restaurant to her husband at the table. I was right, Joe. It is John Grisham. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was that was funny. Um, now John and I are really good friends. We've done a lot of events together. He's he's a stand-up guy. Anytime I've asked him to do something for charity, he always does, and I love him really. And he was he's as nice as you would hope a guy like him would be. Uh, that moment in my life, not really feeling the love for him at all. <laughs> and my poor wife, you know, to put it put it delicately, she blew iced tea out of her nose. <laughs> You know, I don't know if you've ever done that, but <laughs> it's apparently not as easy as you might think. I knew that she did it because it, like, hit me here. <laughs> and then she looked at the woman, and, and she said very politely, she goes, you know, that's the right genre, but the wrong author. And the woman, to her credit, looked mortified. And she looked at me again, and she goes, oh, my God, are you Baldacci? <laughs> I said, yeah, I am. So obviously, she was so chagrined that I was not Monsieur Grisham. She turns and screams across the freaking <laughs> restaurant again to her husband, you are right, Joe. It is the Italian. <laughs> My head was so big that day, you know, the ego thing was just like, so that's why I say, you know, it's not bad to not be recognized in public. <laughs> Um, at least in that way. So, uh, anybody have any questions about any? Yes. Uh, the 
question is simple. Um, you've been writing for a long time. You were a lawyer for a while. Can you talk with us about your reading habits? Have they changed over the years? And do you do any reading in philosophy? Okay. Um, I'm a writer today, I think, because I, I was a reader as a kid. Um, and I've been reading, you know, everything I get my hands on for as long as I can remember. And uh, for me, look, in this, in this book, all I have are little printed symbols on a page that we call words. That's all I have to enthrall you and to engage you in any remarkable way. Um, I don't have moving pictures. I don't have sound. And I thought when I would be totally enthralled and engrossed in a book, what a gift that, would, that was for someone to be able to engage me just with little printed symbols on a page put them together in just the right order. So my reading habits really haven't changed. I read everything I can possibly get my hands on. All sorts of genres. I don't stick to one. I don't, I'm never worried about, gee, if I read a thriller writer, I'm going to somehow inadvertently steal stuff from that person. I read everything from nonfiction to fiction and all types of genres and subgenres because I'm, I love storytelling in all forms, facets, and all methods that people use. So my reading habits really haven't changed much over the years. I just absorb everything. And I have multiple books going. I read three or four or five books at the same time. Just jump around because I just want to know what's in all of them. Philosophy. I, well, I was a political science major. I actually minored in philosophy uh, and history uh, in college. And if you look at a lot of my underlying themes in, in my books, um, one key one is failure and redemption. Um, virtually every character I write about has failed at some point in their life, whether it be King and Maxwell who got drummed out of the Secret Service for messing up and had to rebuild their lives, or a guy like Will Roby doing what he does and trying and having to live with that, uh, or even like a John Puller ne never being able to live up to what his dad expects him to be. People al have always failed in some way. No one is perfect. I don't write about perfection because I don't know anybody who's perfect. Uh, I only write about strong, independent female characters in my novel. That's all I've ever known growing up. My mother was a force of nature. Um, I'm married to another force of nature. My sister is a journalist and writer and very strong, independent woman. Um, so I don't write about damsels in distress. I don't know any. Um, I know a lot of my guy friends who need a lot of help in a lot of ways. You know, <laughs> I don't write about them either. You know, <laughs> kind of feel a little sorry for them. No, but um, so I do. And I and even though I write thrillers, it doesn't mean that I don't really want to have some sort of serious undertones and currents of what I'm trying to deal with. When I first started the Camel Club series, I wrote the Camel Club series, and I and this was really in 2003, three, four, when things were really hairy around the world in the Middle East and, and the wars. And I wrote a story that ha had a number of, of uh, Muslim characters uh, that was written in, in a way that everybody in that in that book was flawed, but everybody in that book was human as well. And the motivations that drove lots of people to do lots of different things uh, could have applied to anybody. And I can't tell you the hate mail and death threats that I got from around the world after that book came out. Uh, it was astonishing to me. Some that, you know, I forwarded on to my friends at the FBI because they seemed kind of serious. But books are supposed to, you know, draw emotions from people. That's the power of the word. This whole country was founded on words, if you think about it, ones that are very famous indeed. Most of the founding fathers were some of the most literate people today. They would be considered highly literate. They probably read more than most of the people in this country do. And they understood what they read, and they thought about what they read, too. So in my books, I didn't start out writing mysteries and thrillers. I spent 15 years of my life writing short stories and uh, starved, <laughs> basically. Because even when I sold a short story, it didn't pay you, you know, because that would have been, oh, we're not going to pay you. You're an artist, right? So uh, they would give you, like, five free copies of the magazine so you could see your byline five times. <laughs> Which is very nice after, but after the second time, it got a little old, you know, and you really wanted to eat, and, and that glossy paper doesn't digest well. Um, so reading for me um, is the greatest skill I will ever have because it allows me to do everything else. And that's why we founded the Wish You Well Foundation. You know, we have 211 million adults in this country. 100 million of them read at the two lowest levels of literacy. 50 million of them are totally illiterate. Another 50 million can't even read a grocery list. We turn out a million high school dropouts a year socioeconomically. They're doomed. How can they compete against a guy from South Korea who has five PhDs? Um, so we are fast becoming an illiterate nation. And we are the most wealthiest, most educated nation on earth in certain narrowing, discrete pockets. Trust me. Mm -hmm. The world here in Washington, D.C., we are a total anomaly. This is not what the rest of the United States looks like. 
I've been all over this country. I've been to virtually every state in this country. We are the most wealthiest educated nation on earth in certain narrowing, discrete pockets. And it's a tough sell in a place like this where I'm sure a lot, all of you here have advanced degrees in something. But that's not really America anymore, unfortunately. So at the Wish You Well Foundation, we spent the last 15 years pumping millions of dollars into programs around the country, trying to drive family literacy, adult literacy, trying to turn people's lives around. Uh, it is very, very tough. There's almost no government money for this, either at the federal or state level. And when you ask experts in the field why that is, they will tell you quite ex you know, explicitly, well, why would the government you know, tacitly acknowledge that the K through 12 program in this country is a failure because if they give money to those types of programs, that's what they're saying, and they're never going to do that. Um, so that's why most of the money in this field comes from private foundations like the Wish You Well Foundation. That was a heck of a long answer to a very short question. Uh, I apologize for the length of it. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. You said earlier on that in this book we will find out something about the protagonist that you set up two books back when you introduced John Fuller. Is that how you write, with the long view and planning out several books in advance? You know, I wish I could say that I, I did. I In this book, I knew that Robert Puller's story would eventually come out. And in, in the first John Puller book, Zero Day, the very first scene where you meet John Puller, you also meet Robert Puller. He's going to prison mm -hmm. to visit his brother. So I knew at some point, whether it be the second, third, fourth book, I was going to have to tackle and resolve that issue. I didn't know it was going to be the third book until I started to write the third book. Um, I'm very much a seat of, seat of my pants writer. I don't outline the whole book. Um, I never know the ending of the book before I sit down to write it. Uh, I'm finishing up another novel. It'll be out in April now. And I... And probably 10 pages away from the ending and probably figured out the ending how I wanted it to end maybe a day ago because there's just so many ways I could have done it I need to get comfortable with the characters and the story and all that really before I I can't say on day one to outline and say okay this is how I'm gonna end a book where I haven't even started writing the book yet and I've always thought that I, if I write wrote from an outline it would, it would read like I wrote from an outline to all of you I'm, I would be like typing until I got to the neatly tied together sort of end that I envisioned in my outline you know, writing is much more free form and radical than that. And you have to just sit down and create and you have to be flexible and you have to let your characters lead you in certain directions. I remember with the Camel Club, Oliver Stone is a very unique character. Sometimes I'd be writing a scene, he would whisper in my ear. He goes, you know, I've got a gun pointed at your head. And um, I wouldn't write the scene that way. That's just not me. You might want to think about that again. <laughs> Little voices in the head. No, I'm, I'm sane, I think, anyway. But uh, you need to have that flexibility. You create these people, and you need to let them run and see what they can do. You've given them life. Okay, well, they also have a brain. So I'm a lot, I'm a more, much more into flexibility than just sort of these strict outlines. And, uh, but I, I feel if I'm writing and I surprise myself any given day, I'm going to stun all of you because I know the story intimately. You don't. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. I was just wondering whether you have any plans to continue with another round of the Camel Club series? The Camel Club is not over. They, they, still, they still have juice left, and, and at least one more book. And the reason I haven't brought them back, I brought them back in an e-book only. It was a short-form e-book, uh, Bullseye, and I um, crossed them with Will Roby, which I thought was kind of cool put them in an adventure together uh, I want to have the right story to bring them back they're they're an ensemble cast um, you know we're trying to set it up as a television series and and they're working on that one really hard they've got a great <coughs> actor to play Oliver Stone who wants to play Oliver Stone if we can get this set up so um, I really do want to bring the camel club back they're very very gratifying to me personally yes ma'am and then you Yeah. Yeah. Well, it it impacted all uh, uh, authors at my publisher until about a week ago, <laughs> uh, when the you know the nine month long battle with Amazon was finally resolved, um, where you you know they took all the buy buttons away, you know you couldn't pre order the Escape until I guess last week, um, and if you ordered any of my other backlist, it would take it would only take one to three weeks for the book to get there from Amazon um, so the business end of it has changed quite a bit but my take on that my philosophical take on that is this I don't care how you read the book the delivery system to me has no importance at all what's important is that you're reading a book 
my book, someone else's book. And, you know, young people, if that's where they live, then that's where we need to go because we can't let generations all of a sudden walk away from books because they have other things they can do on electronic devices. And they're very engaging and very tempting. I mean, I went down the other night and my son was downstairs watching a basketball game. The Wizards were playing. Okay, so I sat down with them and they were, I think they were playing, I don't know, maybe Oklahoma City or the Lakers. And it was a, it was a close game. It was coming down to the end. And I was like, oh my God, you know, I think they're going to beat there. They got a good team this year. And uh, my son looks over and he goes, Dad, you know this is my Xbox, right? <laughs> and I called myself, oh, I said, yeah, of course I did. I, yeah, I was, just, I was kidding you. Uh, amazing. I mean, I thought it was a real basketball game. I, and, I, and, you know, books have to compete with that with young people. But that's okay because, you know, they will come around too. Great. St There's nothing better. Uh, take away. I don't care what you movies or music or Xbox. There is nothing more you know, humanly gratifying than curling up in a chair somewhere, either with an iPad or a Nook or Kindle or a real book, and losing yourself in someone else's imagination and a world and a story they created. There's nothing that comes close to that. And I think young people get that. I really do. But it's our job. My job as a writer, your job, if you have kids, to let them know that you can't miss out on this. Because people who read books, and I say this from lots of experience, are just a lot more interesting than people who don't read books. They are a lot more curious about life. They are a lot more open and tolerant along a variety of different factors. It just makes you a better person overall. Uh, and this, I'll tell you this last point. When, if you want to know the importance of books and in particular libraries to a society, the first thing that dictators do when they take over a country, they close all the libraries and bookstores, all of them, because they represent a diversity of opinion, ideas, thoughts, which is not what a myopic society wants to have. So that's that's all you need to know about the importance of books in a free and open society. You know, you're you're in this great bookstore. Every one of these shelves is filled with someone's ideas about a myriad of subjects. I mean, what could be better than that? My God. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you said your books are translated into lots of languages. Are they ever, like, besides the weird board thing, are they ever changed in any ways? Like, like to be sensitive to the language itself? I'm sure you know, the question was in the translations that the stories get changed to, you know, make sure that they don't in some way uh, malign a, a country or use a scene or language that a, a country's culture might not find acceptable. Um, probably so. I mean, I, ha I can't read them. Um, and, <laughs> and, but the, but the only, but it's a, it's a fair question. Sometimes I do get a little feedback. When I go and travel overseas to other countries, reporters will come in and nine times out of 10, the reporters have read the book in both languages. English and in their native language. And oftentimes they'll tell me, yeah, you know, eh, that translator was not right for this subject. Didn't really get into it. Didn't do a good job. Didn't understand the material. Or, you know, really hit it out of the park. Um, I had one, sometimes, years ago, it doesn't happen anymore, but I would get faxes. Remember faxes? You know, faxes? <laughs> faxes would come in. Uh, I got one from the Japanese translator for, um, I don't even know what book it was. So, her question was, she goes, I have, I have read the manuscript six times, and, um, and I can't figure out where a fish works into the plot. And the line that she had there, which was causing her confusion, was I'd used a colloquial term, coming down the pike. <laughs> she had looked up pike, and a pike was a fish. So um, I'm very glad she faxed me because it would have a very different story uh, in Japanese. Um, and in, in Absolute Power, I think it was Nor Norwegian. I referenced the Zabruder film that, that filmed the Kennedy assassination in Dallas. I referenced the Zabruder film and she wrote very, you know, commonsensically and said, what is a Zabruder? You know, and I wrote back, well, that was his name. You know, that was the man's name who was holding the camera that videotaped the 25 seconds or whatever of the assassination. But she re really wouldn't have any context for that. But as an American writer, I just assumed, you know, that people would know what that is. Yes, ma'am. How much time do you spend revising 
revising and rewriting is where a draft becomes a novel. And I do most of my composition on computer now. Um, so I edit as I go over and over and over. So the time the manuscript is actually done, I probably edited it 20 times. And then I do something else. I print the whole thing out and I, and I take it and I put it on my editing desk and I pick up my pens. I have my multicolored pens and I just see the blood all over the pages. I mean, I, I, I know it sounds weird. I think better in cursive, yeah. you know? Yeah. Because here I'm a good typist. I can type very fast, but there's always a buffer between this, this, and what's there. Here, the cursive, the joined up writing for me means joined up thought. And I, I, even as a lawyer, I always edited all my briefs in cursive. And I think it's awful. They don't really teach cursive anymore in schools. You know, you don't get the same thing with block print, you know. Um, but for me, I, I edit that way. Yes. Thank you. I was a trial lawyer. Could you tell? <laughs> in D.C. Holland and Knight was my last firm. Um, although I was, for most of my career, as I was, a, I was at a small boutique firm, litigated cases ar around the country, uh, had a blast doing it. Um, you know, some of the best fiction I ever wrote was when I was a lawyer, by the way. <laughs> and uh, it seemed like the more stuff I made up, the more often I won, um, <laughs> which was really good. They were sorry to see me go. I, uh, my, my very first case was in um, federal court in Alexandria. And it used to be way back then on South Washington Street. Now it's the bankruptcy court, I think. They've got a brand new courthouse. But So here I am as a brand new lawyer, my first, first case, and I'm walking up the steps, and over it, the name of the courthouse is the Albert, Albert V. Bryan Jr. Courthouse, okay? The famous federal district judge. So I walk in, I go down, you know, the, the huge hallways. It's a beautiful old building. And I enter the Albert V. Bryan Jr. courtroom. And on the wall is a painting of Albert V. Bryan Jr., the famous jurist. And up on the huge bench is this old man, and he is Albert V. Bryan III, <laughs> Jr.'s son, right? And I remember the first time I went into that courtroom, he was on the bench. He looked like he was like 120 years old, you know? And he was leaned to the side. His eyes were half closed. And I thought he was either sleeping <coughs> Um, or maybe had some type of medical condition. I don't know. But what he was actually doing, and I had been forewarned by uh, lawyers who appeared before him, he had a legal pad in his chair, and he was writing down every word you said. And woe be to you if you misspoke, because all of a sudden the eyes would pop open and he would, like, rip you a new one. And it was the, it was the greatest experience for a, a new lawyer, because when you walked in there, and I do this with my books too, or when I'm interviewing people for the books, you had to be prepared for anything in that courtroom and uh, I look back at Judge Bryan and that was you know he made me a far better lawyer because of it it was just a, a great experience for me because you never wanted to see that wrath come down from that bench <laughs> with his father's picture on the wall <laughs> you know it was just very intimidating yes ma'am so, right there hey David Hi. what's your thought on the value of doing a book tour and I ask because very few novelists get sent on a book tour these days because it's cheaper to sit and tweet from your living room sofa you don't have to put on a book I know. What's being lost with authors not traveling the country and doing what you're doing tonight? A lot. I think a lot. Do everybody hear the question, book tour, the, the importance and value of book tours? When I first started out in 96, um, my publisher sent me everywhere. And even more than that, if anybody called me up and said, would you come? I said, yes. You know? So I get a call from a lady. Oh, we're in Nebraska. I've got three members of my book club. I said, I'll be there. Um, she goes, I'll have pot roast for dinner. Terrific, thank you. <laughs> what it did for me was it allowed me to interact with the book community, the reading community, and the book selling community, which is really, really important. I got to meet you know, thousands of readers. They got to meet me. I got to stand up and tell them funny stories. They got to know me as a person. I got to shake their hand, pictures, sign their books. The book selling community, back then I went to almost all independents. Um, just because that's the way the tours are set up and met some of the, you know, the best people I've ever met. You know, running an independent bookstore as, as politics and prose knows is not easy to do and to thrive and survive against a lot of odds is not easy to do. This is how you build a reading community and book tours are a really important part of that. You can't do the same thing. It's almost like if I want to research my books, well, I'll just go Wikipedia. It's very, it might work to a certain extent, but it's also very superficial. I would think that if somebody who knew me just on Twitter, um, or else knew me in person, 
and they were deciding whether to buy my book or someone else's person who knew me on Twitter only might decide to go buy somebody else. He has no connection to me at all. They, he doesn't know me. So I lament the fact that, you know, publishers don't send out novelists, particularly new ones, uh, as much as they used to. I know it's expensive, but I think it's money well worth it. We're not just trying to sell books. I mean, publishers have to make money. I get that. I like to make money. I get that too. But I got into writing because I love this atmosphere. I love reading. I know how much reading has meant to me, how much books have meant to my life. So in going out, I almost feel like I'm a sort of an ambassador for the, the good word of how books and reading are so important. And I'm trying to tell people, I don't have to be here on a Saturday night. You know, I've, I've sold all the books I ever have to sell. But I'm here because I want to talk to people about issues that I think are important. So. I think it's far better to go out on book tours uh, than it is just to sit and tweet. And not only do all of you hopefully get something out of it, um, I get a lot of it too. I meet a lot of great people. I get to tell stories. People get to laugh at my stories sometimes. Um, but it's it's just getting out and being, dare I say it, human. You know. Yes. Um, I am sort of an eclectic reader. I was I picked up a book today my wife had. I'm always snatching her books. She buys a lot of books. So um, it was about this guy who was the Cold War's uh, best spy. He was a Brit, and he um, had been working for Moscow for 30 years. And the CIA chief here, Angleton, who was um, involved in a lot of stuff, unwittingly fed this guy all of our secrets for 30 years. And pretty much every mission that the Brits and the Americans did while this guy was operating, the Russians blew apart because this guy was a spy and nobody knew it. So I just picked it up and I read, before I came here tonight, I read the first hundred pages of the book. I found it fascinating. Sometimes it's just looking at a book and thinking, I'd like to know more about that. As a kid, um, I loved to read about biographies about famous people, but it only chronicled their childhood. And it was a very popular series when I was a kid. And what that made me know is so it, like at the end of the book, it'd be like, oh, and then they got big, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but you saw how they grew up. And for me, growing kid growing up in Richmond, who never went anywhere, I got to see the world and the lives of people who were very successful, but see how they grew up. And I could compare it to sort of my childhood as well. So those books fascinate me. I read lots of fiction. John, John Irving was probably my favorite writer when I was in college and law school. Um, we're both wrestlers. And uh, so if you're a wrestler, you, you know the fact that it's a very intense sport, but it's the only intense sport I know where while you're doing the sport, you're, you have to starve yourself, yeah. basically. You know, I've had enough clear jello to last five lifetimes. <laughs> um, so I read everything John Irving's ever written. I, I met him one time in New York uh, at Tavern on the Green when it was still open. And he was there to accept, he, you know, he won the Oscar for Cider House Rules, the screenwriting. He won the, the, the East Coast equivalent of that uh, that night. And so he got up and he gave a beautiful speech and accepted the award. And I'm over there in the corner. My wife is with me. And um, I said, oh, my God, you know, that's, that's, that's John Irving. She goes, yeah, I know it is. Why don't you go over and say hello? And he goes, I can't do that. That's John Irving. She goes, I know, but you love his books. You're a fan. Go over and tell him you're a fan. I said, I, I, I'm, I'm just too embarrassed. I can't do that. And she's like, oh, my God, you call yourself a thriller writer? <laughs> so, <laughs> So she like grabs me by the arm. She pulls me over. She was like, John, my name's Michelle. My husband, David Baldacci, another writer, huge fan of yours, loves you. You guys take it from there. And she walks off. <laughs> so we got, we really hit it off. You know, he had actually read some of my books. I was stunned, um, but it was just a thrill for me. Uh, to meet a guy like John Irving, and uh, I just think he's a brilliant writer. He reminds me very much, he writes these epic yarns over multi-generations, and he does it with a lot of humor. He almost reminds me a little bit of Mark Twain in that regard. If you, if you think it's hard to write sort of very serious themes and do it and be funny at the same time like a garp, um, you're right, it is incredibly hard. And most writers can't pull it off, but he can. I'll take one more question, and then we'll get your book signed. Yes, ma'am. Great, great question. Um, the Wish You Well Foundation, we formed, we formed it 15 years ago. And what we do, we basically say to programs around the country, send us applications and we will try to help fund you. So in the course of a given year, we will probably get 
5,000 applications from organizations around the country. We have a board of directors. We have a full-time uh, director who runs a foundation for us. And all those applications are read and vetted. And then the board of directors meets on them. We meet like four times a year. And we will approve as many of those applications as we can uh, that are in keeping with our mission. And we also try to improve these organizations, too, with their financials. You know, if we see that one organization is a little bit light on a donor base, uh, then we'll say, you know what, we'll give you this grant. But on the condition that you have to go out and match it with a brand new donor you don't currently have, which makes them get up and develop their donor base a little bit more. We have a program also called Feeding Body and Mind. And that's the book collection effort. About five years ago, we kept getting donation requests or grant requests from organizations saying, yeah, we need money for tutors and content. We also need money for food. And we were like, why, why do you meet, need money for food? He said, well, most of our patrons coming in, uh, they're going to miss a meal. They have limited money to buy food. Uh, so we would like to feed them while they're here learning and also with their kids. Their kids come with them. Okay, we get that. So we called up Feeding America in Chicago, and they run all the nation's food banks, like 245 of them, including the one here. And uh, we said, look, I'm going to go out on my book tours, and I'm going to send these big white boxes ahead of time, and my fans will fill these boxes up with new and gently used books. And once they're full, we'll pay to have those boxes shipped to your food banks, wherever their books are collected. Will you do that? Will you partner with us? And they said, absolutely. So what we've done is we've become the book collection machine. And then the, the food banks have thousands of facilities around the country where they, the pipeline, where they do soup kitchens and churches and other places where the, movie, the food goes out. So all we do is graft or piggyback on top of the food. Because nine times out of 10, higher than that, actually, people going in seeking food assistance have low job skills because they have low literacy skills. Just poverty and literacy go hand in hand. If you're illiterate... You're impoverished. This, this is the way it is. So over the last five years, we've shipped out over uh, like over a million, 1.2 million books to food banks around the United States. And the theory being that you need food to survive, but it can't alone break out that cycle of poverty. Getting the hands, the books into the hands of people who may never have even had a book, uh, getting in books into homes where books may never have been, and really importantly too for the next generation, giving books to kids. Uh, that they can get excited about literacy and reading and see how it can change their lives. We're trying to empower people uh, to give them the tools they need to do better in life so they can become self-sustaining. Look, if you, uh, literally, if you can't read, you can't do anything. And if we solve the problem of illiteracy in this country, it is completely connected to every other social and economic ill that we have as a nation. If we solve that, then we solve a lot of the things we're confronting. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Have a great holiday.